Hey, how you doing? Justin back with you again for the second part of Unit 6 in the Major Scale Maestro course. This one is going to be about exploring legato. First of all, what is legato? Well, legato means smoothly. In practice, it means picking less, which means you're going to be using hammer-ons and flick-offs to create your musical statements. Now, most of you are probably familiar with hammer-ons and flick-offs already. I should mention as well that I call them flick-offs. Most other guitar sites call it a pull-off. I just think that it doesn't pull anywhere, but your finger does flick off to better descriptive terms. So that's what I use. The shorthand for them, H-O for hammer-on and F-O for flick-off. Don't forget to grab your PDF download as well, free for website users. Of course, just click that download icon below and you've got your scale pattern there and the tab for this lesson where we're going to be exploring the hammer-ons and flick-offs. Even in this digital age, I think it can be a useful thing to have that kind of thing printed out so you can write on it with a pen and make your own notes about things, fingerings or things that you need to work on, that kind of stuff. So a really good question you might ask is why legato? Why would you want to do legato anyway? Why use hammer-ons and flick-offs when you can pick your notes? Well, there's quite a few reasons, actually. The first one is that it's usually faster. Now, not for everyone. Some guys are really, really good at picking. I find picking really fast pretty difficult. So for me, it's a lot easier to use legato. So just as a little example here, if I take that little section of pattern two, and I want to play it quickly with a pick. It gets sloppy pretty quickly. I'm, I'm double picking. There's there's problems there, which we can discuss picking in another adventure. But uh, if I use hammer-ons and flick-offs instead, so I go pick, hammer, hammer, pick, hammer, hammer, flick, flick, pick, flick, flick, hammer, hammer, pick, hammer, hammer, flick, flick, pick, flick, flick. You can see it's actually, it, it feels smoother and it's obviously a lot faster and there's less kind of duffy notes. It does sound different, which is part two of why actually you might want to use legato is for the fluidity of it. Now, uh, a lot of jazz players say it sounds more saxophone-like. I guess when you play with a pick, you get a lot of attack. You get that initial... Whereas with you take that away... You can hear it's just it's definitely got a, a, a more kind of flowing thing going on if you want to play legato well you're going to need to do your hammer-ons and flick-offs in time there are a few guys that go like as fast as possible all the time and ignore the beat but i think for most people you want to learn to start off with playing in time so having one e and a two e and a three e and a four e Even at a slower tempo, you're in time. That makes a big difference. And that level of control will really help the dexterity of your fingers in everything that you play. Another great thing that you'll get from exploring legato is your awareness of dynamics. Pick notes are generally a lot louder than the ones that you get when you do a hammer on and flick off. In order to even that out, you need to pick a little softer otherwise it just might sound a little bit lumpy like some parts are really smooth then the pick notes kind of stand out in a often ugly way so in order to even that out you need to learn to pick a little softer if i don't do that and you get this you can hear it's like if you're trying to pick quieten that pick down still there a little bit but a lot less. So you, being aware of that and starting to learn to control your pick is another benefit from working on this stuff. The last thing on my list of reasons why practicing legato is good is that if you're going to play fast legato, you have to relax. And this is one of those interesting things. When you start exploring legato, you're going to have to do it quite deliberately with quite a lot of pressure. It'll be very much like a hammer-on, very tense. But in order to develop any fluidity and speed, you need to relax. So you're going to learn about this transition of, of, of doing things with a lot of tension. And then as you start to speed it up, your fingers start to dance. So at the beginning, you'll be doing this kind of... There's a lot of tension there. I'm really having to do it. But as soon as I try and get faster now, here's... Now it starts to get this... It's like your fingers kind of dance along the frets rather than it being like a lot of pressure. 
And most times that happens as you transition through the speed barrier. So you go through this point where it's like, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. It's like, oh, hang on, I have to relax to get through it. And again, that's the kind of thing that really can affect everything that you play because you learn to keep your hand relaxed and only use tension when it's actually needed. So let's go through now and talk a little bit about the techniques specifically. So a hammer on. Literally, you pick one note and then you hammer down another finger. So let's do all of these things as an application in pattern one, which is a really good place to start. Once you feel confident with that, you might want to apply it to all of the other patterns. But as usual, pattern one seems like a pretty good place to start to me. So we would play the first note with the second finger, and then we're going to have to hammer little finger down. Now, for many of you, that's already going to be pretty difficult, but bear with it. It might sound like this to start off with, like you, <laughs> you go for, ah. but you, what you want to do is try and use the tip of your finger and give it a good thwack, hammer it down, think of it as a hammer action. Then when we go on to the next string, you're going to pick that first note with the first finger and then hammer the second finger and hammer the little finger. So you can see I'm kind of telegraphing it. Pick, hammer, hammer. And that's okay to start off with. Okay, if you're new to this sort of thing, be okay with doing a hammer. Okay, like I said, later on you want to remove some of that tension and make it dance. But to begin with, to get the technique right, you need to be going hammer, pick, hammer, hammer. Next string, pick, hammer, hammer. Trying to get your finger in a nice position, of course. Same on the next string. Pick, hammer, pick, hammer, hammer. Again, pick, hammer, pick, hammer, hammer. Trying to keep it nice and in time if you can. Now, when you first start, don't worry about doing it with a metronome. Just try and keep it as even as you can. Don't get into the idea of going like... That's bad to practice that. It's just going to train you. Remember, you are what you eat. If you practice it that way, that's what you're going to make permanent. You don't want to make that permanent. So as soon as you feel like you're doing it reasonably in time, have a go at doing it with a metronome just at a slow tempo, like one note per click at 70 or 80, something like that. Nice and slow. Remember, you pick only when you move to a new string. So pick, hammer, hammer, pick, hammer, pick, hammer, hammer. Now, I would recommend that you start just with the hammer-ons. Most people find flick-offs considerably harder. So do a little bit of work on the hammer-ons, first of all, then have a go at the flick-offs. Once you're confident you can do both, if you find flick-offs a lot harder, see if you can do a bit more practice on them. So if you're doing a five-minute practice slot, maybe do three minutes working on the flick-offs and just two on the hammer-on so that you end up not lopsided. So let's have a look at the flick-offs now. And you can see I've put my fingers down already on all of the notes that are going to be played on that thinnest string. We're going to play the first note and then flick off little finger and then flick off second finger. Okay, now it's worth noting that that flick off is enough to get the sound happening. So even if I don't play that note with a little finger and just flick it off, you can see it's, it's like it's picking the string. And the same with the second finger to the first finger. So then we end up with this pick, flick, flick. Next string would just be pick, flick. For most people, you're going to find that very, very difficult. Make sure first finger is touching the thinner string there because what you don't want to do is go... And when you pick little, when little finger flicks off, it flicks the first string too. That would be a very common problem. So just keep first finger there touching the thinner string. So if little finger flicks too far, it's not going to play that note as well. Then onto the next string is going to be little finger, flicky off to third finger, flicky off to first finger. Same on the next string. And then four, two, one, four, two, one then either play or hammer on that second finger to come back to the root. So again, real slow. Pick, flick, flick, pick, flick, flick, pick, 
flick, flick, pick, flick, flick, pick. So flick offs particularly, I think, when you first start practicing them, you really want to think about that flicking motion. When you get faster, the flick doesn't feel the same, but you want to start with that so you've got the mechanics correct because you do need those fingers to flick off the string to sound the next note. It's really, really important. Now, I've said quite a few times already about how important it is to relax. Tension really is the enemy of speed. If you want to do anything fast, you have to be relaxed. So think of it, if you tense your whole arm and you try and punch with your arm, tense it just doesn't work whereas if you're relaxed you can kind of throw it that's a really immediately physically obvious version that you can just try it yourself to prove it to yourself that that's how it's going to work so you're going to go through this stage of doing things with a lot of tension a very deliberate movement of a hammer on which has got tension it's like a hammer and then this flicking it off motion once you get used to it and you're practicing it and you're doing it right and you start to speed it up a little bit, see if you can try and relax it a bit. So even if it, it doesn't have to be super fast, but if you're going... Even at that speed, I'm still trying to think about trying to keep it relaxed. Okay, so when it gets really fast, you, you have to relax. In the very early stages, you should go through this period where you're playing it deliberately. Once you're confident with that, start to look for the relaxed feeling. Try and break away some of that tension and think about it being relaxed. You still want the notes to be clear. Again, you might be wanting to think about picking a little softer so there's not this massive disparity between the pick notes and the hammer-ons and flick-offs. But you will notice that there's a stage. You have to do it with the tension and the deliberate motions, first of all, before you start trying to get rid of the tension. A really important thing to realize about legato playing is that it's not an exclusive thing. You don't have to play all picked or all legato. It can be a complete jumble of picking and sliding and legato. There aren't any rules here. I would suggest practicing legato on its own as an exercise, but when it comes to the real world to improvising, you can really mix it up. In fact, you should mix it up Okay, when it's for real, when you're playing. When you're practicing, it can be worth deliberately trying to use legato while you're improvising to kind of work it into your technique. It doesn't want to be something that's switched on, so you need to blend it with your regular playing so that it'll start to come out on its own. It doesn't want to be something where you go, oh, I'm going to play legato and switch it, and then you're do only doing that. You, you want it to be worked in, and the way to do that is to combine it with things that you're doing already. So when you're working on your improvising, you play some of your regular stuff and then do a little bit of legato and then go back to your regular stuff. Force a little bit of legato in backwards and forwards between the things that you're used to doing and the new thing, and hopefully you start to blend it all together. One last thing I want to mention before we get into the practice routine for this unit, and that is using your attention. I've seen a few people explaining these kind of techniques and saying it's a good idea to do it while you're watching telly, and I don't think that is the right place for this. It can be later. So occasionally there's good reasons to distract yourself while you're playing. Like if you're doing fingerstyle pattern, once you've got it right, it can be worth practicing it while you're watching telly so you're developing the automation. And playing the gado, there is an argument to say that some of that automation is a good thing, but what you want to be careful of is with the timing. I don't think it's a good idea to practice legato without it being in time. Okay? Like I said, there are rock guys where they play like a line as fast as possible and disregard the beat. But I think that can also develop some bad habits. And if you, I would recommend that you learn to play in time first of all. So playing with a metronome or if not with a metronome, really focusing on staying in time. And that deserves attention. My recommendation would be to do this practice with a metronome as soon as you can play them at a consistent tempo. Obviously, you're not going to be able to do that while you're first learning. That would force you into doing bad habits if you're trying to play with a metronome before you've properly memorized it. But as soon as you can do the technique and you've memorized the scales, you should be doing it with a metronome and really focusing on your timing, even if it's really slow. 
Speed is a byproduct of practice and doing it consistently, correctly, and doing it with the metronome is going to be the best way to achieve that. Okay, let's talk about your practice routine for unit six. I think you're going to need 10 minutes, two five-minute slots, but you're going to alternate between two different routines. The first one is going to be about the scale pattern. So the first one will be practicing pattern four, playing it up and down, getting super confident with it. When you feel like you're absolutely on top of pattern four, you might use that five-minute slot to practice all of the four patterns that you've done so far. So maybe playing just twice on pattern one, pattern two, pattern three, pattern four. Just trying to mix it in again so that it starts to feel like it's part of those other practice sessions as well. So that would be one five minute slot. The second half would be improvising within pattern four. So definitely for maybe a week or two weeks, you want to improvise only within pattern four. Start using the regular fingering, then go into the one finger solos, but staying within pattern four. And then if you still need a little bit more time working on the other stuff, part B, which is going to be the hammer-ons and flick-offs, maybe you go into improvising within all of the patterns that you've done so far. Maybe you start by just using patterns four and three, combining them together a little bit. Then maybe four Four, three and two combining them together a bit and then working on patterns four three two and one and being able to move confidently between all of them try remembering that you're trying to build it into one big scale pattern that's the long-term goal we talk about that a little bit further down the line now the second part of the practice is going to be to do with the hammer-ons and flick offs so i'd recommend you start in pattern one practice using hammer-ons and flick offs to play the scale up and down only when you feel confident in pattern one, try it in pattern two. Only when you're confident with pattern one and two, maybe start applying it to pattern three, then one, two, three, and four. The same thing is going to go for part B, which would be another five minute session, which would be improvising with a focus on using hammer ons and flick offs. So, like I said, when you really play for real, you should just mix it all up together. There shouldn't be a set amount of hammer ons and flick offs or whatever, but this is practice and I want you to practice using hammer-ons and flick-offs in your improvising. Okay, so really focus on that aspect of the improvising. You're deliberately trying to fit that in. Okay, it's an important step of the process. For sure, when you're improvising for real, and you might do that every few practice sessions, just go, okay, I'm just going to jam it now. I'm just going to have some fun and play whatever and see where I get to. Hopefully, some of that hammer-on and flick-off stuff will start to come out. But when you're practicing, Keep your attention on that one particular thing. So just to rerun that to make sure that you're totally clear, on the first day, say on a Monday, you're going to practice the pattern four of the major scale, just playing it up and down with the metronome, making sure that you're playing it in time, that you got it memorized. And part B would be improvising within pattern four. Okay, so staying within that pattern, just improvising within it. So five minutes on each one of those things. As you get a little bit better, you might start expanding into the other patterns. The second day, you would do the major scale pattern one, focusing on the hammer-ons and flick-offs, and then another five-minute session improvising within pattern one over a backing track and getting used to deliberately forcing in those hammer-ons and flick-offs, which you've just been practicing. As you develop, as you get better, you expand that beyond pattern one into pattern one, pattern two, pattern three, and pattern four. But do it gradually. Don't just try and play all over the neck with all your hammer-ons and flick-offs right away. That isn't the way to do it. You're much better off working on a smaller area and making music out of it, getting comfortable with it before you expand it into other parts of the neck. You know, one of the most fun things about this whole major scale thing is jamming with your friends. So if you're enjoying this course, do tell them to go and check out the Major Scale Maestro course on justinguitar.com and that way you can have some great jam sessions, okay? Really appreciate your support. Do remember if you're ever on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, click the bell icon to get notified when I've got new lessons. Don't forget to register on the website as well and set up my practice assistant so you can track your practice. If you haven't been over the website lately, do go and check it out. There's loads and loads of new stuff and a bunch of really cool features coming very soon. So I'll see you for unit seven when you've finished and mastered this stuff. Bye-bye.